All right, trying again here. Am I amplified? All right, great. All right, so we are gonna call this committee hearing to order. Uh, welcome everyone. Today is Monday, March 6th, 2023. This is the hearing of the Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee. The time is about six minutes after three o'clock. We are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building and a quorum is present. Uh, members and to the public, we have five items on our agenda, five bills. And the first two bills are mine. So I will ask Vice Chair Morrison to take the gavel as I make my way up to the table. Welcome to the testifiers table, Chair Double. Please proceed with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, thank you for the honor and the opportunity to present Senate file number 1624. Uh, and uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senate file 1624, even though it's uh, many pages, I'm trying to count how many pages it is, it's like 17 pages, it's actually a very simple bill. Um, it's very straightforward. It's a legislative proposal to eliminate how the Met Council is selected and seated from having all of its uh, 16 members and uh, then the chair as well appointed by the governor. Uh, and rather, there would be 17 Met Council members representing districts and they would be elected. M Madam Chair and members, the Met Council is somewhat of a paradox. On the one hand, it is a local unit of government, also known in our legal language as a political subdivision, which is akin to a county or a city. It is also at the same time a cabinet level state agency. Its chair is full time and paid as such and is a member of the governor's cabinet and serves at his pleasure. Likewise, um, the members uh, serve, are appointed and serve at the pleasure of the governor. Um, they, are, uh, they work part time, uh, are paid on a part time basis. In its capacity as a local unit of government, it has the powers and duties you might imagine, the power to levy property taxes, the power to establish land use regulations metro-wide, the power to plan, then build, own, and operate major infrastructure and systems, most significantly sewer and transit. It has the power to plan and direct via funding other major services, such as affordable housing, regional parks, and local economic development. It has the authority to supersede the power of local and state elected officials in all manners it deems to be inconsistent with the regional policies it has established, including such things as development and zoning. It has the ability to determine that any development or facility is of regional significance and can assert, assert a measure of authority over that development or that facility. As a local unit of government, it receives funds directly from entities such as the federal government or its own property taxes and is fully empowered to expend those resources as it sees fit, absent an appropriation from anyone in elective office. As a state agency, it is entirely beholden to the authority, political and policy priorities of the governor. As such, the chair and, and council members are constrained from articulating or promoting any idea or initiative outside of what the chief executive has authorized. Its budget and corresponding values, initiatives, and priorities is kept under wraps until the moment the entirety of the governor's budget is announced in February of a given year, preventing the building of a budget in a region-wide collaborative fashion. Further, any governor's budget is a function of trade-offs and political calculations, figuring out what to emphasize in a given biennium in his or her, among his or her 24 cabinet level agencies, whether the priority for that year is education, healthcare, environment, and so on. So Madam Chair and members, I believe this approach would solve a number of problems. Uh, first of all, the basic uh, challenge and problem of legitimacy. Such substantial powers should be subject to elective office, those who hold elective office and are accountable for such power. 
the inability to really fully uh, coordinate and participate um, as, they, as they could and should with regional, other regional stakeholders and the public. Um, it lacks, I believe, a certain level of responsiveness um, that is gained through the kind of accountability that is afforded by holding elective office. And as such, is often insensitive to uh, good information, ideas, thoughts, and input from stakeholders and members of the public. I can cite a number of examples. Of course, we know that um, Southwest LRT, we'll hear a lot more about that in the coming weeks with the delivery of the investigation that's being conducted by the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Um, and I believe that much of what we found uh, and, and have experienced with Southwest LRT, whether going all the way back to the planning phase of Southwest LRT and the routing uh, and scoping decisions, as well as the more recent issues that have cropped up around cost and schedule um, are attributable to the lack of sensitivity and accountability and responsiveness to the public and to other stakeholders in the region. Our bus system we've seen has been vastly degraded uh, over recent years. A highly talented leader of the bus system was fired uh, and um, was never replaced with anyone who, of equal skill. And we've seen that um, the bus system is lacking sorely in um, the level of service, the amount of service, and the quality of the service. And we'll hear in a, in a couple of days probably um, a bill of mine that's going to address some of the public safety issues that we've heard so much about. Just uh, a few weeks ago, we heard the governor's budget proposed for the Metropolitan Council and advanced was only uh, a proposal to increase uh, funding in the metro area available for transit of one eighth of a cent. We've been hearing for a number of years now about the looming fiscal cliff uh, that our bus system is facing, our transit system is facing, uh, so, so dire that uh, as soon as we run out of reserve funds and federal funds, the bus system would be effectively dismantled, uh, absent uh, addressing this fiscal cliff. And this one eighth of a cent um, doesn't even begin to address uh, that fiscal problem. This is not what an elective body would advocate for. An elective body would advocate vigorously for what its essential system and services need. Um, a few years ago, we saw a budget proposal come forward uh, in which the sales tax that counties raise, five of the counties in the metropolitan area raise sales tax for transportation purposes, which um, you know they have the authority to dedicate to transit or any other transportation purpose uh, they see fit. And there was a full uh, accounting for exactly how those county raised for which those county commissioners as an elected officials are are accountable and responsible, a full programming of those county sales tax dollars. The first those counties had heard of it was upon revelation and re of, of, the, of the budget that the governor had proposed at that time. Uh, I think an elective body um, that is in deep relationship and connection to the region it serves probably would have developed a proposal uh, that was had mutual and, and widespread buy-in and support. Um, and. Uh, just some qualitative issues, Madam Chair. Uh, the 16 council members um, you know, have a fiduciary and political and, and social and political responsibility um, to represent the interests of their, of their districts. They're appointed by district, yet um, there's a, a lacking presence of, the, of those council members. Um, they're not fully present in the discussions that occur among the cities and the counties uh, and the other leaders uh, in their districts. They're, they're not present, and they report to me directly. I've had these conversations with council members. They feel constrained from stepping out and stepping outside of the lane that's been prescribed and proscribed for them by um, the governor and, and the chair and the regional administrator. But Madam Chair, if I could just uh, pivot for one moment um, and just talk about the opportunity cost that, that there is in, in lacking this kind of entity that would be elected and representative and responsive to the region that it's set up to serve. Um, as I described earlier, the entity is a, is a creature, uh, it's a local unit of government, but also a, a creature of, of, a, of a cabinet. Um, and so as such, um, is often, you know, third, fourth, fifth, tenth, twelfth um, in, in the priority list of the, of the executive branch. No matter how wonderful and amazing a governor might be, governors have a statewide set of 
policies and, and priorities to balance. And, and this is just one in a, in a large deck that, that needs to be shuffled. And what we lack is uh, an entity that has as its number one goal advocating for what the metropolitan area needs. Uh, and it is tasked with and goes about the work uh, to create that vision, that buy-in, that collaboration, that excitement, uh, and, and really uh, has a single singular focus on what the region needs and what it needs to do to achieve those outcomes, whether those be policy outcomes or economic development outcomes or making sure that everyone is sharing in the prosperity that we're able to generate in this region. And so um, I think, Madam Chair, um, that is the reason for this proposal. The details of the bill I won't necessarily go into because it's pretty straightforward and I'm not necessarily um, you know, completely wedded to this. You know, this is how we would construe the Met Council and this is how all the details of the election would run, et cetera, et cetera. If anyone has critiques on that subject, I'm wide open to that conversation. My intention, Madam Chair, is to lay this bill on the table today as well as the next bill, which uh, is on a similar topic, um, so that we can all engage in a more deep and wholesome conversation, fulsome conversation about this proposal. Uh, Madam Chair, I have uh, two individuals who are very learned on this subject. Uh, uh, former Senator Myron Orfield, uh, as well as uh, Robert Liberty, who is a former Portland uh, Met Councilor, uh, the only uh, regional entity in our country that is elected, although um, hopefully there will be more in the not too distant future. So if I may turn attention to uh, Myron Orfield uh, to make a presentation. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair Double. And Professor Orfield, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can, am I can you hear me? Uh, my name is Myron Orfield. Uh, I am the Earl R. Larson Professor of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law at the University of Minnesota Law School. I've been a former uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. I Professor, can I ask you to kind of lean into the microphone okay. a little bit? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, no thank you. Uh, I'm a law professor at the University of Minnesota and the director of the Institute on Metropolitan Opportunity. I have a long history with this issue. I've written two books about the Twin Cities metropolitan area, one called Region Planning the Future of the Twin Cities in 2010, another Metro Politics, which was about my experience in the legislature on the issues of the Metropolitan Council in the 1990s. I had the good fortune to author the most recent reforms to the Met Council in 1994 with then Representative Pawlenty. He and I both authored the most recent Metropolitan Council structural reform and we both wanted it to be elected, as did the initial authors of the Metropolitan Council, two Republican legislatures, or conservative legislators, they were caucus then, Harmon Ogdahl and Bill Frenzel. It was always the intention that this body be an elected body. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the council and, it, and how it, it's a very odd figure in American traditional local government politics. I, I can tell you as a professor of local government law and of constitutional law, there's nothing like this in the United States that has this much broad discretionary authority and taxing power. There's, no, there's nothing at all like it. There's nothing even close to it anywhere in the United States. It is the tra tradition in America, the tradition, and it may be uh, that this may have exceeded constitutional limits, but it's at least the tradition for bodies that have broad discretionary authority and taxing power. It is the tradition in American law, almost without exception, that they be directly elected. Uh, there are three real forms of government that we can compare the Met Council to. Uh, one would be a state agency, which operates under a specific and narrow charge with clear and decipherable standards. Uh, another is a general purpose local government, like a municipality or a county. Uh, and they, almost without exception, the United States are directly elected. And the U.S. Supreme Court requires that they be apportioned one person, one vote. And then you have special purpose uh, districts, uh, local governments that do one or two things. Again, like an agency under a narrow grant of authority, sometimes they're elected, sometimes special districts are appointed. Usually they have clear discretionary authority. So you can, the next slide, you can take a look at, th these are some pictures and you can see school districts of the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Those are special districts that have to be elected, one person, one vote. Uh, you can have school districts, uh, um, the Metropolitan Council, uh, you can see its jurisdiction on the bottom. Uh, uh, special districts, the slides, 
uh, in the second category, and then the counties, which are were created about the time the state was created, and they were administrative units designed so that every person in the state could be one day's horseback ride uh, from uh, a county to register deeds or to file court papers. They were designed based on the horse system uh, back then. Next slide. This is, you can see, this is the, all the local units of government combined in the Metropolitan Council, and the Metropolitan Council has authority almost all, over all these types of local governments, particularly municipalities, in, in, terms, of their, uh, in terms of their general uh, and comprehensive plans. Next slide. Uh, you can see the counties move on to the next. These are cities and townships. Again, these are directly elected. Next. These are school districts directly elected. The next. Uh, and that Metropolitan Council, you can see the MUSA line in, in that category. Let's get to the next slide. Um, watershed districts, the next slide. So here's the council's budget, 1.224 billion. This is 2022. It's a larger budget than almost anything in the state except Hennepin County or the city of Minneapolis. So it's a very large expenditure. It also has much more debt than any of these agencies. Next slide. Uh, this is the revenue sources. You can see 37.5% uh, are, are state revenues, 12% are uh, uh, taxes and fees. You can see 26% are charges, 15% uh, federal revenues, and then 7.4% property taxes. It's the authority to levy property taxes, which is, uh, again, unique for uh, uh, an agency. Uh, you can see the expenditures. Transportation is 70%. Environmental services, sewers are 17%. Uh, 12 percent is community development and housing. Next slide. Uh, you can take a look. These are the changes to the MUSA line. Uh, the next slide. So this is the MUSA line. The Metropolitan Council sets an urban growth boundary. It has discretion to decide how big it is. It can make it big. It can make it little. It has, there's no real clear delineation of what it should be. There's no real decipherable standard. This is 90, 98. Let's go to the next one. Here is, uh, two th this is 2000. Next slide. 2010. 2020, 2030, 2040, and next slide. And so it has power to decide this. It's broad discretionary authority. It has a power to decide what the land uses are like outside the urban growth boundary. So it can decide where we're going to grow or where we're not going to grow. It can set density targets. It can regulate the land outside the muse. It can make it one per 40. It can make it one per 10. It can make two acre lots. It can decide without any real particular standard. And you can see the MUSA has been growing and expanding in, in kind of unpredictable ways. Hard to, hard to anyone predict. Next slide. This is the, uh, the highway system. It has the, as the MPO, it has the ability to designate where the highways go. It can say the highways go to the north, they can go to the south, they can go to the west. They can decide whether all the money will be spent on uh, adding capacity or whether the money will be spent on repairing the existing roads. It can decide to spend the money on transit or highways. And again, we're talking about billions of dollars every year in federal transfer with complete discretion, with no real decipherable standards about how to do this. Next slide. Here's the sewer system. Again, hundreds of millions of dollars of bonded debt, uh, much bigger bonded debt than Hennepin County or other local unit of government. In the legislature, when I was there, and I believe that it's the case, when you issue bonded debt, you have to have a two-thirds vote of the legislature to issue bonds. Met Council can issue bonds whenever it wants to. It can decide to build sewers here or there or everywhere or nowhere. Uh, it could decide to build sewers in one direction and highways in another direction. There's no real definitive authority. It has a real, uh, essentially unlimited power to decide how the region grows and how it does it. It, has a, it can decide who, how to charge for the sewers. It can charge new development for the sewers. It can make the existing cities pay for the sewers within uh, pretty narrow legislative guidelines. Next slide. Uh, Again, this is just in general. In general, the idea that when something has broad authority, when it's like a municipality, when it's like a county, the tradition in America is that it be directly elected. Now, what about this? I mean, is, it, it can't, it's, if it was an administrative agency, it would be subject to the Administrative Procedures Act and have uh, notice and comment rulemaking and all the kinds of protections there. It would have a limited and clear grant of authority. It's not a state agency because it isn't a statewide jurisdiction. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't abide by the Administrative Procedure Act. It creates policies that are very hard to understand in terms of what they mean. Uh, there isn't the same kind of legal input and, out and, and um, observation that a, a normal executive agency would have. Um, and in this case, 
when uh, you know, the legislature has the authority to delegate pure legislative power to a local government, to a city, particularly a home rule city. But when the legislature is delegating legislative power, when it's delegating discretionary authority, uh, it may well be that it has to go to some kind of an elected agency. It may well be that the, the legislature can't delegate unlimited legislative authority to an administrative agency without clear standards, without other kinds of procedural safeguards. So you have at least, there's nothing like the Metropolitan Council in the United States. There's nothing even close to ha this having this kind of broad multidisciplinary authority, this tax, kind of taxing power. There doesn't exist another precedent like this. There are a few water agencies in the Southwest that manage uh, uh, you know, power and water together, but it, those those agencies are large in, in scale and scope, but they don't have this kind of discretion. They don't have this kind of absolute unlimited discretion, or very uh, almost unlimited discretion. Um, so I guess it's a question of what's the best way to do this. And uh, the, the authors of the Met Council originally, Harmon Ogdahl and Bill Frenzel, thought that it should be elected, and it failed by a tie vote in the Senate. When I was a, a member of the legislature with Representative Plenty in a bipartisan manner, we forwarded the most recent reform to the Met Council and we both wanted it to be elected and were disappointed when it wasn't elected. Uh, the measure passed the Senate once by one vote and Governor Carlson vetoed it. Even though Governor Carlson had uh, carried a bill to make the council elected when he was a member of the legislature from the same district that Scott and I uh, represented at that time. So its history is elected, its tradition is elected, there's a strong question about whether the legislature can delegate this kind of sweeping multi-dimensional authority with taxing power to an unelected uh, quasi-agency. So uh, you, have a, you have a law professor who used to be a state senator. They talk beyond their limits usually, so I'd be happy to uh, uh, answer questions, and I, I appreciate uh, the chance to be here. Thank you very much for your testimony, Professor Orfield. I think we'll, we'll go to next testifiers, and then if you'll stay to for the discussion, that would be wonderful. So I think up next we have um, Robert Liberty on Zoom. If you could please yes. state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, my name is Robert Liberty. I hope my audio is clear. It is, excellent. All right. Madam Chair and members of the committee, good afternoon. I'm here to share some thoughts with you as a former member of the elected governing council for Metro, which may be helpful as you consider this important legislation. Briefly about me, I'm a member of the Oregon Bar. I've been involved in land use and transportation planning policy and politics for over 40 years. I've done consulting at the local, state, regional, national level, including in the Twin Cities. And I currently uh, serve on another uh, regional uh, council, the Bi-State Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area Commission. Let me start with a big picture. Call to mind the images of our Earth at night as seen from space with the brilliant constellations of light of the metropolitan regions, big and small. Those spangles of light surrounded by only a few smaller points of light are the reality of how we as a species are now organized. Metropolitan regions are the basic fundamental units of social and economic organization. But with few exceptions in the world, and only one exception in the United States, there is a dangerous disconnect between the reality of our social and economic organization and the structure of government and the principles of democracy. Connecting metropolitan governance with democracy is not just a matter of principle, fairness, or logic. It's a practical problem as well. How can an entity with regional responsibilities and regional power make the right decisions when it does not benefit from the interaction it must have with voters and other constituents. An elected metropolitan government is almost certain to pay more attention, not less to the many local governments in its boundary, since it will be accountable to the same set of voters. Now to some specifics about Metro. Metro is a regional government for the Oregon part of the Portland metropolitan region. Within Metro's boundary are 1.5 million residents, 24 cities, and the urbanized portions of three counties. Like the Met Council, Metro has significant, although identical, regional responsibilities and powers. Metro adopts and amends the regional framework plan to which all local government plans and local government regulations must conform. It adopted, regularly reviews, and when necessary, amends the regional urban growth boundary, overseeing an extremely rigorous analysis of land supply and need for housing and employment. It serves as the Metropolitan Planning Organization under federal law for the receipt and disbursement 
of federal transportation plans and adopts the regional transport. I'm sorry, regional transportation funds and adopts a regional transportation plan. It has the authority to absorb the regional transit agency, although it has so far declined to do so. It is responsible for all waste prevention, recycling, and waste disposal for any material generated or brought inside its boundaries and has regional contracts for related facilities, transport, and operations. It owns and operates regional meeting, arts, and visitors facilities, including the Oregon Convention Center, Oregon Zoo, Expo Center, and various arts venues. It owns and operates 12,000 acres of regionally important natural areas. It has broad taxing authority, and it has the power to extend its authority to new matters that it finds to be of regional significance, <clears throat> such as housing. Metro is directly accountable to the voters. The voters elect six councilors and the council president. Council districts each contain about 250,000 residents. I was elected to represent the voters and other residents in District 6 in 2004 and was reelected in 2008. Metro itself was created by a vote of the people in 1979 when it replaced the former Regional Council of Governments. In 1992, the voters approved Metro's Home Rule Charter. The charter preamble states, we the people of the Portland Area Metropolitan Service District, in order to establish an elected, visible, and accountable regional government that is responsive to the citizens of the region and works cooperatively with our local governments, that undertakes as its most important service, planning and policy making to preserve and enhance the quality of life and the environment for ourselves and future generations, and that provides regional services needed and desired by the citizens in efficient and effective manner, do ordain in this charter for the Portland Area Metropolitan Service District to be known as Metro. Metro has received the voters' approval for billions of dollars of investment in affordable housing, housing supportive services, parks and open space, and its regional facilities. And yes, sometimes the voters have chosen to vote down various Metro funding measures. That's democracy. Metro Council benefits from its monthly consultation with the Metropolitan Policy Advisory Committee, MPAC. MPAC is mandated by the Metro Charter. It's made up of mayors, city councilors, county commissioners, and representatives of other governments. For several years, I served as one of the Metro Council liaisons to MPAC and watched how it served not just to inform the Metro Council, but also became a platform for mutual education for local governments. This arrangement also gave members of local governments, especially smaller ones, the unusual opportunity to weigh in on regional scale issues that they never had occasion or reason to consider at their local proceedings. During my tenure, there was an effort by one of the cities to seek legislation to curtail Metro's power over land regulation. But several mayors rallied to Metro's defense, including mayors who had, on occasion, had serious disagreements with Metro. Despite those disagreements, in their minds, it was essential to them as local governments to be part of a regional approach that allowed their local communities to succeed together and avoid inter-regional competition. A regional government actually made it easier for them to maintain their differences. A legislator challenged a prominent mayor about why he supported maintaining Metro's power if he disagreed with Metro on certain issues. I paraphrase his reply this way. Well, I have many disagreements with the federal government too, but that doesn't mean I want to abolish it. I mentioned that Metro replaced its predecessor, which was a Council of Governments, a COG. Over the years, I've had a chance to work with many COGs, especially in California, in the context of regional transportation and land use planning. COG councilors are elected by and accountable to a particular set of voters and unit of government. To the extent that they support a regional approach in their role on the governing body of a COG, that differs from their locality's needs, then they're failing to represent the interests of the people who elected them. They have a political and ethical imperative to be parochial, not regional. One of the advantages of an elected council is that councilor elections create visibility for the big decisions on policy and investment. Council candidates, like all candidates, advocate for different policy positions on regional issues that except for their context in an election would receive scant or no public vetting. A heated policy debate between candidates is inherently more interesting to reporters and bloggers than routine deliberations and votes. Voters seem more interested as well. Yesterday, I checked total votes cast in the 2022 primary election in Multnomah County, 
which is home to about one half of the residents of Metro. Not all of Metro County is inside of Metro, so this analysis will slightly underestimate the relative interest in Metro Council races compared to other races. Here are the numbers. In the May 2022 primary, there were 161,611 votes cast for the Democratic and Republican candidates for the U.S. Senate. 164,970 people voted for the Republican and Democratic candidates for governor. In the same election, 177,890 people voted in the nonpartisan race for Metro Council president, a 10% higher voter participation rate than for the U.S. Senate and an 8% higher turnout than the race for governor. Based on our experience in the Portland region, our elected Metro Council helps advance democracy, government accountability, and it's just common sense. If you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And thank you for your public service. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Liberty. I do want to note uh, that we have a quorum. Uh, and now we're going to open it up to people who have signed up to testify. And in order to ensure that all interested parties have a chance to speak, we're going to limit testimony to two minutes each. So if um, I ask you to wrap up, please do as quickly as you're able to. So first up, we have Commissioner Marion Green. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Um, thank you so much. Uh Thank you, Chair Morrison. Thank you, Senator Dibble. And thank you, fellow senators. My name is Marion Green. I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner from District 3 and Chair of the Hennepin County Regional Rail Authority. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify on SF 1624. So Hennepin County is home to 1.3 million residents, has one third of the state's jobs, and the administrator of the state's largest social safety net. As such, the county has a deep interest in the current and future success of the region and the state. Metro counties throughout, through county boards and county regional rail authorities play a significant role in the region's public transit system, helping to identify and develop potential transit corridors, raising funds for these projects. Hennepin County seeks to serve residents with convenient, equitable access to jobs, schools, their daily, residents' daily needs, and we're doing our part, uh, we're doing so in part by providing the capital funding and paying a portion of the operating costs for our light rail system, commuter rail, and bus rapid transit lines. Hennepin County is also committed to combating climate change and working collectively with the region to meet the state's carbon emission goals and improving the quality of life for our residents. Last and not least, Hennepin County takes a regional point of view on its work to serve residents. Our vision for our county, where residents thrive, where our economy thrives, that is our vision for the region. And we engage in many partnerships to advance this regional vision. The Met Council is critical to the success of our region to tackle the significant challenges our region faces in building a more equitable economy and tackling climate change. The Met Council's core functions of transit, water, affordable housing, and planning are regional services and with regional stakeholders. But the Met Council's current structure makes it beholden to statewide politics and statewide interests. An elected Met Council will be more accountable to the district and to the voters and to the region that it serves. Restructuring the Met Council is not a new idea, but it's an idea whose time has come. In January 2011, the legislative auditor recommended that the legislature should restructure the governance of the Met Council to increase its credibility, accountability, and effectiveness as the regional transit planner. An elected Met Council is a step in the right direction, but more must be done to ensure a thriving region. The transit system also needs dedicated and significant funding to deliver a more equitable, high quality transit options to confront our climate crisis and to build a thriving economy to compete economically with our peer regions, one of whom we just heard about. Uh, Madam Chair and members, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next up, I believe we have Mayor Janet Williams from Savage. <laughs> Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair, if if the committee would indulge, uh, my name is Patricia Nauman. I'm the executive director of Metro Cities, and if it's okay, I'd like to just 
sort of have the opportunity to introduce the two mayors who are here today and provide very brief testimony. If of course. Right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members, for the opportunity to comment today on Senate File 1624. Uh, my name is Patricia Nauman. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Metropolitan Municipalities or Metro Cities. And I appreciate the opportunity to comment today, and I've certainly appreciated Senator Dibble's longstanding interest and in work with us on the um, issue of regional governance. Uh, Metro Cities does stand here today to respectfully oppose this legislation. I want to just give you brief background. I did provide a letter to the committee as well, but just briefly, Metro Cities does represent the interest of metropolitan cities at the Metropolitan Council in addition to the legislature and executive branch. The association was created in part to provide this representation. This means that Metro Cities monitors the work of the council across its scope of activity and responds to both regional policies and decisions to make sure that city interests are accounted for in regional decisions. This is due to the strong nexus that exists between the work of the region and the work of local governments who are responsible for implement, implementing the vast majority of regional policies and requirements. Therefore, the cities consider themselves to actually be the primary constituency of the Metropolitan Council. Metro Cities has conducted periodic studies of regional governance over the years with city officials from throughout the region, and those studies have consistently resulted in support for some improvements and modifications to the governance structure of the Metropolitan Council. These do include staggering the terms of Metropolitan Council members, adding more local uh, uh, participation on the statutory nominating committee to make sure that local voices are heard, more transparency in how members are nominated and ultimately selected, and then also in strengthening the defined requirements for council members to make sure that they are representative of the region as well as accounting for local uh, knowledge and approaches. Studies have considered but have not recommended an elected metropolitan council throughout the history of Metro Cities. We've been in existence since 1974. Cities have identified several concerns with this model, which the two mayors uh, here today will address. And overall, I'll just say that they are concerned that such a model would end up fracturing the regional government and potentially paralyze it in its function to provide the very core essential services upon which cities as well as their residents and businesses depend. It would also serve to potentially distance local government officials from regional decision making and that's a key reason that we do oppose this legislation today. Um, Madam Chair and members, I would be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Nauman. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. And Mayor Wearsome, you're, you can join at the table too. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Janet Williams, the Mayor of Savage. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in 60, Senate File 1624. As someone who has participated in the last four statutory nominating committees that recommend members to the Met Council, I am here to express my opposition to this legislation. The committee has expanded and operates with transparency. Applications, re resumes, and letters of recommendation are submitted to the Secretary of State and forwarded to the committee. We review them as a group and select up to five from each district to interview at four locations around the region. Interviews are open to the public and online. That is over 80 people that we interviewed in the last few weeks. Per statute, up to three of those are selected from the dist each district and are forwarded to the governor. They were announced last week after being forwarded to the Senate. Candidate pools are diverse. Interests vary from housing, transit, parks, wastewater, planning, environment, to e equity. Some have been elected and others uh, have very, um, area, various areas of um, interest and expertise. They are served, interested in serving the region and are willing to devote a minimum of 20 hours per month, usually more like 40. The process is rigorous, balanced, and consistent with the Met Council charge to provide regional service. I know we hear about um, that every four years when we have our nominating committee meetings that people are like replaced and every, we have all new people who need to be trained and whatever and that might be that really is not the case because some of them some of them um, one of ours that has been on the commission since the Plenty administration 
I apologize for this. Under the legislate under this legislation, members would be accountable to individual districts. Studies by the Citizens League, the Metropolitan Council, and most recently in 2020, the Blue Ribbon Task Force on the Met Council spelled out why an elected council is not in the best interest of the region. We don't need another layer of government. Cities, the county's council's clear constituency, have not asked for this change. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mayor. Sorry about um, that. Mayor Wearson, welcome to the test fires table. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Brad Wearson, Mayor of the City of Minnetonka. Chair Dibble and Vice Chair Morrison and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Senate File 1624. As a mayor, I appreciate the opportunity to express some concerns with the governance changes proposed in this bill. The Metropolitan Council was specifically created to address regional problems and was intentionally designed to be accountable to the governor, legislature, and city officials. Cities are subject to the council's authority for land use and for vital regional systems, including transit and wastewater treatment. Cities depend on the Met Council to ensure that systems benefit the region as a whole and are timed, built, and maintained appropriately. Cities do not always agree with the Met Council. They don't, they, don't always, they don't always like the Met Council, but cities respect the Met Council and they, reply, they rely upon the services it provides. City leaders stand ready to collaborate with the Met Council to help solve problems as they arise. The structure of the Council should not be sacrificed to address either general calls for accountability or because of specific problems. Problems should be addressed individually, and solutions should be specific to the issue. An elected council would not resolve specific problems and would create numerous difficult and unintended consequences. I believe that strategic decisions should not be made for tactical reasons. An elected council would likely be more susceptible to pressures from local officials and others. It could end up as a fractured, paralyzed entity less able to address regional needs and problems. Parochial interests would likely interfere with true regional governance. The role of the council is to ensure our region has the infrastructure and services required for our region to be strong and competitive, both nationally and globally. A governance change of this type would imperil our region's longstanding reputation for efficiency, services, and infrastructure. Thank you for your attention to these concerns. Have a good day. Thank you for your testimony. Mayors, if you would um, stay in the audience for the discussion, that would be fantastic. Um, our next testifier, I believe, is remote, uh, David Robbins. If you're on, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, yes, uh, uh, good afternoon, Senators. Uh, I appreciate your time. Again, thank you for letting me be here. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Uh, Proceed. Very good. Okay, thank you again. Uh, my name is David Robbins. I'm a resident of the city of Robbinsdale. I'm here to represent uh, SLR 81 or Stoplight Rail on County Road 81. We're a group formed to support any of the communities along the currently planned Blue Line extension. We're pleased to be uh, part of the Metro Area uh, Transit Done Right Coalition, and we wish to express our solidarity with uh, their agenda and in support of Senator Dibble's bill, SF 1624. With all due respect to members of the Met Council, we feel the lack of accountability enabled by their appointment rather than by our election or than by election has been a great disservice to our community. There is no better example of the repercussions of this than the massive financial boondoggle represented by the Southwest Light Rail Corridor project. The light rail initiative is the most costly public works project in the history of the state of Minnesota. It demands greater accountability that a person in an elected role is even more incentivized, obligated, and bound by principle to provide. Any of you can certainly appreciate the incentive you have to represent your constituents transparently and responsibly. You could not expect re-election if you did anything otherwise. Um, the problems that have plagued the Southwest Light Rail Corridor may have been averted if elected accountability were in place at the time of planning and construction. It should serve as a cautionary tale 
for all future planning and construction of light rail projects, but re remarkably, it has not. The enormously costly Blue Line Extension Plan continues to forge ahead despite this enormous blot on the record of the Met Council. In the interim, many cities, my own included, are feeling the effects of a lack of leadership from our own district representative. His unreliable presence at city council work sessions and community open houses has been noteworthy. I anticipate the open house scheduled tonight at Elam Lutheran Church in Robbinsdale will not be attended. Uh, uh, excuse me, will um, will be attended by underinformed staffers who are well intentioned but are not able to speak authoritatively about the project as a whole. The process of municipal consent and how Robbinsdale has or has not consented to the Blue Line Extension project remains a mystery to most of us. I appreciate your time, and I ask for your support of Senator Dibble's bill. Your advocacy and leadership here will speak volumes to each of your constituents about how you recognize the benefit of elected leadership in the Met Council. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Mary Paddock, who I believe is here. Great. Please come to the testifier's table. Welcome. Please state, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Mary Paddock. I live in Minneapolis. I'm in Senator Dibble's district. Um, I'm here to speak for this bill because we believe that the Med Council is structurally unresponsive, that it is staff driven and therefore not responsible to the people. Organizations in my area, Minneapolis, spent years fighting the Met Council selection of the Kenilworth route for Southwest LRT. We told them the construction would be problematic because of poor soil. We told them it was unsafe to run light rail feet away from freight trains that are carrying explosive hazmat. We told them that digging a tunnel this far away from a decades old concrete residential building would be a problem, that it would damage the building. The condo residents even spent tens of thousands of dollars to hire um, engineers to document that. But the council, as you well know, ignored us. We're just citizens. What do we know? It proceeded as it wished and ran into the exact problems we predicted. As you know, these are actually the very problems that have caused the $500 million overrun. Astonishingly, the council now claims that those problems were unforeseen. Unforeseen my foot. They were the product of a Met Council that is staff driven, of a government body whose leaders are untethered from the realities of the people who pay their salaries and whose lives are enormously affected by their decisions. And I just want to go back to something that Senator Dibble alluded to. There have been governors in, the, in my lifetime which I've agreed with and governors that I have not agreed with. I don't think any of them were corrupt. But if you look even at recent history, you will see that there are plenty of instances where governors were corrupt. Illinois, Tennessee, Louisiana, Oklahoma, North Dakota, West Virginia, and Alabama. It could happen here. And to give one person that much opportunity for power and money with no recourse is an open invitation to corruption, possibly even to organized crime. It could happen here. So we support this bill. Thank you, Senator Dibble, and thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, I have Tim David. Are you in the room? Yes, you are. Please come to the testifier's table. Welcome. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Tim David, and thank you, uh, committee members, uh, Madam Chair and Chair. 
For the past 20 months, I've been leading the group uh, opposing the Purple Line BRT from St. Paul through Maplewood to White Bear Lake because we do not feel it fits our communities. We fully support SF1624. I worked previously at the city of Minneapolis as an analyst for 12 years and 13 years at Deloitte Consulting, evaluating the performance of government agencies, including their governance, and helping them improve the delivery of services. So I have some background in the area of service delivery. Our group over those 20 months has talked to and listened to thousands of residents in the communities, hundreds of businesses, and numerous local elected officials who oppose this particular proposed project because it does not fit into our communities. We've held public forum, forums, rallies, pop-up events, installed 300 yard signs, and 7,000 7, people have signed our petitions, and the overarching message we hear from folks is the lack of accountability of the Met Council. It took us thousands of hours of volunteer time to do this work, and we should not need to expend this energy. We should have members on the Met Council that are elected to represent us. We've struggled with how to articulate how we, the public, feel treated by the Met Council. Rather than technical examples showing lack of accountability, you've heard some of those already, let me offer a short parable about what public engagement with the Met Council feels like and the lack of accountability to the public feels like. And I'll preface this with the point that I oppose bullying of any kind. Bear with me. The third graders are out on the playground enjoying the sunny day. A sixth grade bully steps onto the playground and says to the third grader, do you want me to slap you in the face or do you want me to punch you in the stomach? When the bully is confronted by anyone in a position of authority, the bully says, well, I asked for his input and he didn't want to be slapped in the face, so I hit him in the stomach. Oh, and the bully adds, and three of his friends were watching, so really, I had public engagement with four people. That is how the public in our communities feel. We get punched in the gut. And who are we supposed to call? Our Met Council members? They do not represent us as constituents. And to those Met Council members who are watching, I hope they are, with all due respect to you as individuals, we did not elect you. Elected council members is a start, but only a start in the reform and restructure needed at the Met Council. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else who would like to testify who's in the room? Okay, Senator Dibble. Any final closing remarks before we discuss? <laughs> uh, no, thanks. I'm. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm available for uh, questions, amendments, discussion. Members, discussion, questions, amendments. Senator Herf. Just out of curious, actually, uh, Senator Dibble, I actually asked you just just one on one, but what happened to that appointment that already on to the members now? Are they running for re-election again this fall? So, uh, thank you for the question, Senator, Senator Herr. Um, uh, so, uh, at present, um, so so the bill, what the bill would propose to do would to um, hold elections. Uh, next year, 2024, um, and uh, currently we have um, council members serving. They serve until um, this this new slate of council members is uh, seated uh, and confirmed by the Senate. I'm actually not quite clear exactly when they take their seats, but at some point they would come forward and uh, and take and be confirmed by the Senate. Likewise, the the chair. Um, has been renewed by the governor, and he would need to be uh, confirmed by the Senate. Um, I think, um, well, I won't, there, you know, there was, a, there was, there were some questions about whether or not we could replace um, them in, in kind of midstream, midterm, whether that was a violation of the, yeah, I know you didn't ask this, but I'm getting into it anyways, um, uh, whether or not that was a, a a violation of the separation of powers. I think we've ascertained that that is not, so. Thank you. Other questions, members? Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Dibble, I guess, how did you determine that uh, you were gonna maintain the 17 
members and not reduce it and make the districts larger? And was that a consideration, or you just decided to keep the same structure, basically, with, with it being elected instead of appointed? Senator Debel. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I would confess I didn't consider reducing the number. I didn't think that hard about it. But um, in, in considering the, exist, the existing number, the seven, the chair plus the 16, you know, so we'd have to redistrict slightly, the um, uh, metropolitan area population is about 13 point something million, 13.1. So each constituency, each district would be comprised of about 200 and some thousand people. So that's a, that's a lot, that's a pretty large uh, district. So reducing it would make it even that much larger. So I thought, you know, I mean, we represent 80 some thousand. So it feels like a lot sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it feels like a lot. Um, so 200 and some in order to be uh, effective and responsive and accessible would, would be as big, a, as, as large as I'd want to go. Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for follow-up. So, you know, we heard uh, discussion about there's, you know, they, there's, they really don't need another layer of, uh, of government, but truly isn't there another layer of government already, but it's appointed, not elected? Is that not the case that we're looking at? Senator Dibble. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Senator Howe, for the question. Um, yes, I agree with your point, and my, I had that exact thought when that argument was made. Um, but what I also uh, hear uh, from those who would critique this proposal, again, you didn't answer, ask this question, but I'm gonna answer it anyways, which is, um, wouldn't the, you know, we have a lot of elective bodies, we have a lot of government in Minnesota, and people don't know who Soil and Water Conservation Board is, where the judges are, you know, why would they, you know, they bear, <laughs> They barely know who, well, I, I'm gonna get to that's my punchline actually. Um, but I thought Mr. Liberty uh, uh, has, a, has a fairly effective rebuttal to that argument uh, given the experience of Portland in which um, the participation rate and those voting for their metropolitan area government elected officials, their met counsel, metro councilors was higher than they even had for governor and US Senate. So clearly, you know, and, and I, that, that actually is logical to me. I used to work for a city council member and the city council delivers services that are very, very close to people's lives, very tangible, affect everyone's daily lives. And um, I think people really understand government public services and, and, uh, and delivery of public services uh, when they feel it and touch it every single day. Believe me, our town hall meetings were packed to the rafters when I worked for a council member and whenever there's any kind of issue, we heard about it. Um, they knew her name and they knew how to find her and they voted in large numbers in those city council seats. And so I think um, that addresses that concern that people have. And my punchline of course is, you know, people barely know who their state senator is. This is actually Nick Prince's line. People don't know who their state senator is and they don't care. Uh, you know, so we all struggle with that, that kind of, uh, that, that issue. Um, and it, I don't think it exonerates or removes, I think, very well outlined by Mr. Liberty and Mr. Orfield and the others, um, this level of power. I mean, it is an awesome level of power. Property taxes, preemption over local units of governments who pass laws by elected officials, those kinds of powers that are delegated entirely to uh, totally transparent, or totally invisible, not transparent level of government. Sorry, long-winded answer to a very easy question. Senator, how follow up? <laughs> I got one, one more question and then I'll, I'll pause. But uh, so ex how will the accountability change from what our current structure is to the, your, if this bill passes and becomes law, how will the accountability for these folks actually change uh, from what we currently have to what, what you propose here? Thank, Senator Debel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the question, Senator Howe. Um, so at present, if someone is grumpy about uh, a decision that the Met Council makes, um, well, if they're grumpy at us, for example, um, you know, we say things, we do things, we take votes, um, we champion policy proposals, et cetera, that a constituent disagrees with, you know, it's pretty direct, line of accountability, you know, where, you know, we are accountable for what we say as senators, we're accountable for 
um, the votes we take in committee and on the floor, we're accountable for the legislation that we propose, and people can make a different decision, or they can decide to support us. Um, when uh, the Met Council uh, you know, levies property taxes, spends federal dollars, makes major decisions uh, about land use, makes major decisions about transit, makes major decisions about sewer. Um, you know, there's, there's really no one to call. You can call your council member, they typically don't return your call. Um, you can call the bureaucracy, they, they don't really return your call. You can call the chair, the chair doesn't return your call. The governor is the only one who's on the hook um, in terms of elective office. And when someone is considering who to vote for for governor, um, they're also considering many, 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 many other issues about uh, what they want in their chief executive. And so would people really hold a governor to account for the decisions that this, this council, this you know, elect local unit of government ostensibly, that's also kind of a state agency, um, that's, that's the level of accountability that exists at present. And, and it would be much, much more, much director line of accountability to the districts that that council member serves. Madam Chair, I, I apologize. Senator Howe. Thank you. I have an alibi as, as you answered that. It brings up another question for me. So currently, there's, in your legislation, there's going to be districts. So someone's going to be accountable to that district. Is that the same that we have now? Are these 17 picked for a district, or they, could you have more from one area than another, or how is that done? Senator Devil. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Senator Howe. Um, so at present, there are 16 districts, so there would be 17 under this proposal. It, of course, can change. I'm not completely you know, wedded to the, every detail and every word of this legislative proposal. And yes, every council member at present is appointed to those districts. Um, and so, yes, every, uh, everyone under this proposal would be elected. They would have to, of course, live in that district and be elected by the, the voters of that district. Yep. Senator, how are you good? <laughs> Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, so I, I guess I agree with you on a lot of things, and we've gotten along over the years on a lot of different policies and disagreed on some, but uh, when you said the governor has way too much power, I, I agree. And, and I don't know of any other taxing authority that's not elected that, that spends this much money. I know there's some local like Economic Development Authority members, things like that in some small towns, but nothing that has this degree of taxing authority and, and power. So it's a concern of mine as well. And, and I think, and I don't, you know, I came from a rural Minnesota, so I don't know the, the history as much as, as most up here in the metro, but I think it started in 1967, I read somewhere. And, and at that time, it was mostly to deal with wastewater, to my knowledge. And, and listening to the testimony, it seems like most the issues that come up, the controversial ones are transportation related. And I think that's what we heard mostly here today. There's an issue with the, the, the way the Med Council is dealing with transportation issues. It seems seems to be the most frustration as uh, Ms. Paddock brought up and, and that was well stated in some of the issues only in Minnesota and it was a $500 million overrun of, of what's going on. So I agree with your bill and, and I want to thank you for bringing it forward. It does bring a lot of issues up and, and some of those things are, are very concerning obviously. Um, but I, you know, you think of the election side elected as, as well and, and we all know the demographics of Minnesota where the blue and the red are and, and I think it's, it's going to typically be kind of the same type of a, of a group of people that are, are making decisions um, on what's going on. But I, I think it does make more sense to have it elected so there's some accountability. Uh, again, and, and, and as you first stated, this is way too much power on the governor and, and, a, and, a, and a group that's not elected. So uh, thank you again for bringing it forward. And I think a lot of good uh, testimony was brought here today. Thank you. Members, other questions? Senator Dibble, anything you want to, any thoughts you want to leave us with before we lay the bill on the table? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, reemphasize my belief, and I know that and I respect the perspectives of those who um, feel invested in the current structure as it is, but it is my belief that um, quite the opposite would occur on the Met Council, um, and that um, a Met Council that is in, in, in deep relationship uh, with the communities that it serves, whether you believe that cities are the only or primary constituency of the Met Council, or if you believe uh, in a Met Council that it actually has a broader constituency, that's what I happen to believe, um, that it's not just council members and mayors, but it's, it's all elected officials, but it's 
everyone in the, in the metropolitan area, those who are served by our, their sewer systems, their housing, um, their parks, their transit, um, you know, very, very direct services that affect literally everyone's life in very tangible ways every single day. Um, and elected Met Council um, not only um, would confer a legitimacy and, and overcome some of the constitutional issues that, that Senator Dr. Orfield uh, outlined, um, but would create a much better opportunity for unity and cohesion and collaboration and would be situated to vigorously advocate for what the metropolitan area needs vis-a-vis -vis the state and vis-a-vis -vis pulling everyone together around a common frame and common uh, vision for, for what our region needs as it competes with other regions and tries to create as much prosperity as possible for as many people here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble. So with that, we will lay Senate File 1624 on the table and move on to your next bill, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the next bill is 1625. Uh, and uh, Madam Chair, I would like to, before I get going, offer an author's amendment, the A3. So I move the A3, and uh, maybe Mr. Greenfield could just describe what the A3 does before we adopt it. This is basically a technical change. I want to make sure that a couple of lines are not captured. Uh, Th thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. I'm just going to walk through the A3, which should be already distributed and posted. Um, the first change on the A3 is just a rewording of the first section to make it flow more uh, coherently. Uh, it still has the two conditions um, that were proposed in, in section one, um, but it just places those conditions at the beginning to then establish that the Commissioner of Transportation is the responsible authority. Uh, and then page four after line 20 is inserting an effective date for the bill, which just provides some clarifying language about the applicability of the shift if the responsible authority and um, then applies to um, full funding grant agreements that are agreed upon after the day following final enactment. So there's just a question of what has been captured by this language and um, section 10 just attempts to provide a clear timeline for what would be um, amended under this bill. Thank you. Okay, so we will um, move to adopt the A3 amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Okay, the amendment is adopted. Senator Dibble, proceed. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So very simply, what Senate File 1625 would propose to do uh, would be to um, transfer the responsibility for building uh, transit way infrastructure um, that costs $100 million or more uh, to the Department of Transportation. Um, and again, just for purposes of construction and upon completion of construction, um, those facilities then would revert to the ownership and, and operating of the Metropolitan Council. Um, this is how the blue line, um, the connection or what we know as Hiawatha, the Hiawatha line uh, was built. Um, the light rail transit line that runs between downtown Minneapolis and the Mall of America and, and the airport and back. Um, and uh, Madam Chair, the reason I'm proposing to do so um, is because, um, and we'll, we'll find out more of course, and I could be completely wrong, maybe the legislative auditor's report is gonna say everything's fine, a few little changes, I'm wide open to being completely wrong. Um, you know, that's why we have a legislative auditor, they do this kind of work um, totally objectively without, you know, fear or favor and um, report the facts as they understand them. Um, so maybe 1625 has no purpose and fine. I'll be happy if that's the case. Um, but um, it seems apparent to me that, uh, that the experience of the Department of Transportation in managing these very, very large capital projects uh, managing the uh, give and take and the kind of rough and tumble of large prime contractors and the change in, you know, in negotiating through and navigating through the, the, the inevitable uh, contracting process and then subsequent 
change orders that result in the, uh, the subsequent uh, implications for uh, the critical path and the critical schedule um, is, is extremely well handled by the Department of Transportation. Um, this is what they do. Um, they do it every single day. Uh, Met Council um, has relatively little experience in this arena, and it's, I think it's shown up in, in really glaring ways with the how Southwest LRT, and there are some very specific examples. Um, and Madam Chair, uh, I have with me, and I didn't make copies of it, but I'm happy to share. I think a lot of the committee members have seen you know, the document that ultimately gave rise to the uh, investigation that's going on currently by the legislative auditor. Um, some concerns were brought to, brought to my attention, and I sent them over to the L OLA to take a look at. And that was, you know, this is that question. Um, you know, we're hearing about increasing costs, much more, by the way, Senator Jasinski, than 500 million. We're well over two times the cost and on our way to three times the cost and, you know, decade or so of delay. Um, and and, um, and some, some evidence that much of this additional cost and delay could have been avoided. Some of it is attributable going way upstream to the some of the early planning and decisions that were made, but some of it has to do with how the construction project itself is being managed. Um, what's interesting, though, about that, Madam Chair, and this speaks to the previous bill, is that um, uh, the Met Council, pretty much in every step of the way, was made aware of some overrun, overestimations in pricing and time estimates and the like. The Met Council is required by the Federal Transit Administration to hire a third party uh, evaluator to give advice on pricing and bidding of change orders and implications for schedule. Um, and unfortunately, uh, more times than not, rejected that professional advice from this particular entity. Um, that information came to light, was investigated, was shown to have you know, some, some substantial merit. Um, in fact, that particular contractor was so dismayed that it required the Met Council to place language on the documents that went forward to the entity that made decisions about the change orders um, uh, uh, in the nature of a disclaimer that this did not reflect the, the best professional advice of their firm to protect their legal interest and protect their professional reputation. Um, I'm sad to report that uh, I then learned that um, the principal engineers uh, that were managing that contract on behalf of, of, of that company, you know, to, you know, to help them at council uh, get good information, um, were forced off that contract. Um, subsequently, um, that particular firm was separated from, from the Met Council and not renewed. And the current firm is now pretty much under a muzzle and gag order, not to disclose anything publicly by way of what it communicates uh, to the Met Council. So um, there's some real substantive problems there. Um, some specific examples that were brought to light um, more recently, Madam Chair, have to do with what might be a fairly minor matter, but it's just indicative and kind of a, a case study of, of what's going on. Um, there were some uh, instances where uh, little bits of chain link fence needed to be uh, attached to gaps that, that there were in you know, protecting and keeping the public out of the right of way. There are certain spots that weren't anticipated necessarily. Um, you know, there were fence, fencing would run along the right of way, along the tracks, and then there are spots where it would have to be connected to um, like bridge railings and, and things like that. And uh, so that was construed as a change order and the little, tiny little stretch of fencing was priced. Um, and um, it was kind of an eye-popping estimate in the, in the amount um, that was cited uh, to the Met Council, um, way, way more than, than they would have priced the same product and service uh, to the Metropolitan Council. Um, eventually that price was negotiated down a little bit after I brought the whole issue to light. Um, but it still ended up uh, many times more uh, almost 200% uh, more than, than should have been. Um, and then even more recently, just a few weeks ago, um, uh, it was brought to my attention that um, the exact same subcontractor doing substantially similar work on behalf of the Department of Transportation um, with stretches of chain link to fill in little gaps of, of, of a wider width 
um, we're, we're pricing you know, around $650 per spot um, versus what they ended up paying to the Met Council, which was $2,500 per spot. So these, these are the kinds of issues that cro have cropped up time and time and time again. That would be an indication that perhaps MnDOT should be building these very, very large, uh, very, very complicated, very expensive public works infrastructure projects and then turning, they're the, the entity with the capacity and the, and the ability and the knowledge. Um, additionally, I'll just add anecdotally, Madam Chair, that um, MnDOT had offered itself and, and its staffing to, to be of service and of support uh, to the project office at uh, Southwest LRT and um, by all reports, and I've had this told to me by people who were, were staffing those offices, um, that Met Council staff has been very, very resistant to the input and the advice uh, and the expertise brought by those MnDOT staffers to the Southwest personnel who are working on this project. So um, I think, it's, you know, we'll see what the legislative auditor finds and, and what they recommend, but um, this might be a solution to the problems that I've identified. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Double. I have down that you have one testifier from MnDOT, Mr. Rudin. Yeah. Thank you. Not my testifier. <laughs> Not crazy about the idea, but. <laughs> Peace. Welcome to the testifier's table. <laughs> Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eric Rudin with MnDOT Government Affairs. And I just have four brief points I'd like to, to share. Um, the first being that uh, MnDOT would have challenges delivering these projects as well. Uh, the Botno project was uh, estimated to be a $2 billion project before the route change. I don't know that there's a current cost estimate. Uh, the Riverview Corridor streetcar project, if that is a streetcar, would, would also be in that $2 billion range. Uh, so staffing those projects just from a construction staff uh, at the department would be about 100 people, which would be the equivalent of the existing uh, construction staff within the MnDOT Metro District. So um, we have a concern that trying to deliver the existing highway program plus these additional projects would be, would be very challenging. Uh, just to give you an example, we recently had two separate postings for 20 construction inspector, construction inspector positions in our Metro District. And we only had a, a total between the two postings of three qualified external applicants. And we're just having a real challenge uh, competing with pay with, uh, especially in the metro area, local governments and, and the Met Council who can pay higher for, for similar positions. Uh, secondly, the same funding challenges that exist for, for these projects would also exist if, if the projects were transferred to MnDOT. Federal funding for, for LRT and BRT projects is from the Federal Transit Administration, uh, which is not our area of expertise. We, we primarily work with the Federal Highway Administration, uh, and so we don't really have great knowledge of those FTA requirements. Um, we don't have a lot of experience working with counties on, on uh, their county sales tax uh, revenues. So um, We'd also have restrictions, of course, on using trunk highway funds for, for these transit projects, so that would, that would present challenges as well. Uh, third, we do not currently have institutional knowledge on, on construction, constructing these types of projects, especially uh, light rail projects. Uh, things like the overhead cantonary systems, uh, traction power substations, operating systems, and so forth are highly technical. Uh, we just don't have that expertise in-house. And so we'd also have difficulties quantifying the risks of, of those types of systems. And uh, since the Met Council would be the ultimate owner and operator, they would really need to be the one to accept that work. Um, and so, uh, you know, having it be, having MnDOT be sort of the intermediary between the contractor and the Met Council would add an additional layer of, um, of sort of approvals that are needed and, and we think the possibility for uh, disputes related to the acceptance of those systems and, and delay is, is there as well. Uh, finally, if, if we were to take over these projects, uh, we think there would be several other risks, including um, you know, the, the potential to take over existing contracts with contractors uh, and consultants, 
as well as environmental permitting risks. We, we think it would be challenging to take over some of these environmental permits that have been issued to the Met Council and, and try to transfer them to MnDOT. Um, there are construction uh, contract administration challenges uh, with trying to administer a project that's actually funded by a, a different entity. So it's not clear who would have the authority to approve change orders. We would need to uh, have some sort of agreement that would give uh, the department authority to spend those other entities' money and negotiate uh, changes on their behalf. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We're, we're happy to, to work with Senator Dibble. We, we do have a couple alternative approaches that, that could be considered, including uh, we recently did a peer review of the Southwest Light Rail project, um, and so uh, continuing that for, for future projects um, would be something that we could, we could look at. Uh, Senator Dibble mentioned the, the staff, the MnDOT staff, that, that do work on these projects. We could look to see if there are opportunities to um, to do that uh, work more closely with, with my council staff um, through our existing partnership, partnership agreement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Members, Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as, as much as uh, I, uh, I agree with uh, some of the comments that uh, Mr. Rudine has stated, I, if I'm a betting person, I'm betting my, uh, I'm betting on MnDOT to do a much better job at this than Met Council has done, uh, especially with the Southwest Light Rail and the debacle that that has turned into. Especially when we had testimony that they had other engineering firms getting alternate information and saying that this was a bad idea and there was problems and. Someone at the Met Council, I don't know how their operation runs as far as who they have on staff to, to take notice and take that information, but apparently uh, they don't, you know, when I'm, I, as a building official, and I even get engineering, and I'm looking at it going, I don't know if that's going to work. I request a second opinion. I don't know, understand how the Met Council doesn't ask for second opinions and more data. And my concern is, is if, if, if they can't get this right, I would believe that at least you have identified what you need to make it right. And maybe your alternative approaches and peer reviews and that stuff could help. But I, uh, I have a tendency to believe that, that this approach would at least save us some money and maybe have some projects looked at with a little bit keener eye than they really don't have any responsibility or accountability where at least at MnDOT, you folks are accountable to the commissioner who's accountable to the Senate. And I, I just think that it's a much better approach uh, because you have done, MnDOT has done an excruciating, well, good job on some complicated projects, even though we disagree at numerous times, than what I have seen the Met Council do with their, their projects. So, uh, you know, you can respond to that if you like, but I think the, there's, a, you know, we'll take the hit compared to what Met Council has done with the Southwest light rail line. I don't know how that project is ever going to come to fruition and ever going to uh, to uh, be profitable or even even accountable. I don't know how they're going to complete it with the with the debacle of the condos and all the rest of that. So I I don't know where that project's ever going to end up. But I would much I, I actually have more faith in MnDOT being able to make that thing happen than the Met Council having that come to fruition and actually work. So that's just a comment more than a question, but uh, I, I definitely believe that, that uh, MnDOT has got a better handle on how to do those projects than the Met Council. Senator Dibble or Mr. Dean, I don't know if either of you have a response. Senator Dibble. Madam Chair, Senator Howe well said. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just going along those lines, 
you know, uh, I talked earlier with the earlier bill that, you know, the biggest issues are the transportation seems to be in, and I agree, MnDOT does a great job at that. Um, um, but, you know, obviously I represent rural Minnesota, and, and in rural Minnesota we just want to fix potholes and have roads. And, you know, you think about it, uh, and, and I get a, a lot of conversation in my district, you know, in, in the metro you have shiny trains, you have electric buses, and usually you're talking in billions. And in rural Minnesota we're just trying to get millions uh, for some of our roads, and it, it's a big difference. And, and again, I, I think the, the Southwest Light Rail probably is referred to as the biggest boondoggle in Minnesota's history as far as money... Uh, bad spent. Um, so my concern is, and you brought it up a little bit, you know, our concern is, you know, we want program delivery in rural Minnesota for roads, and I know we want it in the metro too, but looking at the, the complexity of, of what you're trying to deal with here, um, and the staffing issues Mr. Redeem brought up, you have to add 100 people for this. Is that taking away from the issues we have to deal with with rural Minnesota and getting our road projects and doing those things and construction projects? Uh, that would be concern. And, I would think somehow there'd have to be a shift of money from the Met Council uh, to cover all those costs that we're doing uh, to you know, do those things. And, and I, you know I've been a, a defender of the HUTDF funds to make sure those are going to roads and bridges and, and not to, towards other things. Um, so that would be my concern um, of doing that and, and just the staffing side of it. Uh, but I do agree that MnDOT could definitely deliver these projects better. Uh, they look at them better. Uh, the overruns aren't there. Uh, I oversaw, you know, when, when we did the Highway 14 project down in, in southern Minnesota, it was done very efficiently, done very well. They looked at uh, how they could do some cost savings, design engineering to do all that. So, again, my concern is, is we'd be taking away from overall Minnesota and, and putting, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Dina, 100 people just on this and staffing. So that's my concern. I get the gist of it, Senator Dibble, what you're trying to do, and I agree with that, but I, I just don't want it to take away from filling potholes in, in rural Minnesota uh, on our roads and bridges. So thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I think Mr. Rudin just dropped in highway user, or, or trunk highway fund just to get just shook up. So <laughs> there's no, we're not gonna be using any trunk highway funds for these, for these purposes. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but everything you said, I, I completely agree with, absolutely. Members, other questions? Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not sure if it's buried in here somewhere, but uh, Senator Dibble, you mentioned that uh, uh, it would take, take over in uh, projects that have a total estimated construction cost of more than 100 million, then MnDOT would take over. Does that include overruns? If you have a $90 million project and now it overruns to some larger number, does that get pushed over to MnDOT? And does that mean that they get all the overruns? Senator Dibble. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Carlson, thank you for the question. It's a good question um, because it's along the same lines of similar questions that have been asked, like would, would MnDOT be taking over the gold line or the Southwest LRT, and the answer to those questions is no. Once, a, once, a, once the lead agency has been designated and you know, full funding grant agreement has been made and uh, the Met Council is, has commenced construction, it's gonna stay with the Met Council. So that's the example of Southwest LRT and Gold Line. They have their FFGAs, their full funding grant agreements, they're under construction, they're gonna stay with the Met Council. So if a capital uh, infrastructure facility is coming in under $100 million, it would not then be MnDOT's um, construction project. It would start with and stay with the Met Council. Mm -hmm. Senator Carlson. Chair. Yeah, follow up. So the, does that mean that the original estimated cost is the only criteria for which agency takes over, which agency does the project? It's only the estimated cost. Senator Dibble. Madam Chair, Senator Carlson, yes, that's correct. Members, other questions? It's Senator House. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble, does that mean that if they estimate low and it comes in high, it would still stay at the Met Council? Senator Dibble. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Howe, we might have to solve that problem, though. You might have an unintended consequence that you're putting your finger on there. So. Yeah, we need, we. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think we need to take a good, honest look at that because uh, uh, 
construction estimates vary widely in, in the last couple of years, so that might, uh, we may need to pay a little more attention to that. Thank you. Senator Dibble, I believe it's your intention to lay this bill over on, lay it on the table. Yes, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to respond quickly to uh, MnDOT's concerns. Um, they're all, I respect everything that MnDOT has brought forward as um, issues. Um, I think it was either Senator Howe or Senator Jasinski who said, gave us a nice little um, roadmap of problems to solve. I don't, didn't hear anything that was insurmountable, so I appreciate MnDOT's testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. So with that, Senate File 1625 as amended is laid on the table. Next up, I believe, is Senator Jasinski. Welcome, Senator Chazinski, to the table. Senate File 721. Oh, uh, members, before I forget, I think I need to say, in accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Senator Lang from Olivia, Minnesota. Senator Chazinski, uh, Senate File 721. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, this you may be somewhat familiar with, Senate File 721 uh, deals with dock fees that our dealerships are playing. Uh, I, as you well know, I'm not a fan of increasing fees that much, but when you put a cap on something, I think you should at least look at that dollar amount, and, and these are simply caps. Uh, each dealer can charge what they want, but this allows a cap so that they be underneath that. Um, and we been talking about this for a while. There's a lot of dock fees and a lot of, it takes a lot of time for our dealers. Uh, so I just want to look at the, the, the cap fees of what we're talking with and it does show that it would go up uh, after a couple years uh, so that we are covering ourselves versus making a cap and then and not being able to get back to it for a while. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Backus who can go through the details. But I do have an A1 amendment that I'd like to offer as an author's amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Jasinski offers the A1 amendment to Senate File 721. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's in your packets, members, is that true? Um, which, uh, if, if you could just, I didn't, ha your, your staff was very good in sending it to me ahead of time and I didn't look at it. If you could briefly you, describe it, thank you. I can explain it. And it, it's, a, it's a delete all, but it's really one small change. Uh, it allows the, the fees to be capped at a higher rate, but it also, uh, it puts a limit on it so it cannot be equal or equal to or 10% of the value of the sale of the lease. So it's for lower valued cars so that they, the, they're not uh, not too high for the lower valued cars. Uh, so that, so right. with that, I'll uh, ask for your approval of the A1. Great. All in favor of the A1, say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Ms. With Backus. that, Mr. Chair, I turn to Ms. Backus. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus here on behalf of the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association and its 375 franchise new car and truck dealers employing nearly 20,000 Minnesotans across the state. And we do appreciate uh, Senator Jasinski bringing this bill forward. Um, so as you can see before you, the Minnesota statute allows dealers to charge a documentary fee to recoup their costs associated with preparing, handling, and processing paperwork on behalf of a customer who's buying or leasing a vehicle. This covers both commercial transactions for the customer, such as paying off a loan on a trade-in, and government-mandated functions, like processing the vehicle title and registration. With the advent of MinDrive, the bulk of the work for entering and pulling together the title and registration has shifted to the dealer and occurs earlier in the sales process. This has increased the workload of dealership personnel and cost to dealerships, leading many of our members and their employees to raise concerns that the statutory cap on the dock fee isn't covering their costs. To verify whether our members, member concerns were valid, our association decided to follow the independent expert review model used last biennium to review driver and vehicle licensing practices. We hired a consulting firm, CLA, to provide an independent evaluation, including time and motion studies, to determine dealership costs of handling customer paperwork. CLA also evaluated the results of an electronic survey of our membership and did a comparison of what other states allow, and the findings are as follows. The results of the time and motion studies and member survey were closely aligned. On average, dealerships spend four hours handling paperwork associated with the sales transaction at a cost of $324 to $409. 
As for how our current dock fee aligns with other states, we are in the minority. 31 states do not regulate the amount of the fee at all, and of the 19 that do, we are second lowest after California. The bill before you raises the statutory cap to $350 over a three-year period. And just a reminder, as Senator Jasinski said, this is a cap. Not all dealers were charged the maximum. In fact, one dealer noted on our survey that he charges nothing and uses that as a marketing tool. But raising the cap gives flexibility and allows our dealers to recover their costs and compensate employees, especially those who are now processing title and registration who used to make money on commission by selling other products products for their extra title and registration work, and this continues to provide consumer protection through legislative oversight of the fee. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Backus. Questions, members? All right. Seeing none. One second. All right. Senator Jasinski, this can go to the floor if you would like. Um, so. I will entertain a motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. One second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, ask for uh, approval of Senate File 721 as amended, be recommended passed, and sent to general orders. All right. Questions on the motion? All right. Would anyone else like to testify on 721? Trying to get in a good habit of that. All right. All right. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. And members. All right. Next, we have Senator Howe. <laughs> Welcome, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to move uh, Senate File 1281. All right. To Senate File 12, Senator Howe moves Senate File 1281. To Senate File 1281, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and members, uh, this, is a basic, this is a real simple bill. What it does is it, on lines 2.12, adds is legally blind for the availability of getting a disabled parking permit. And uh, as you read this, and if you look at the bill, I've struggled, and I tried to do this and get a get this taken care of without making legislation, but I ran into uh, disagreement. If you look at lines 1.20 and 1.21, it says, uh, you know, a person is, because of a disability, cannot walk without the aid of another person, a walker, a cane, crutches, braces, prosthetic device, or wheelchair. Now. When I look at that and I read that, and I think of someone that's legally blind, uh, they either need someone to help them and aid them in their walk, or they need to use their cane to feel their way along around. But when we contact, when the, uh, when the deputy register contacted MnDOT, MnDOT says, no, that's not right. And so MnDOT contacted the Council on Disability and dis the Council on Disability disagreed also that said that no, they shouldn't go there. So, but what we find is other deputy registers who were more familiar and did not check have issued those on a pretty regular basis. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I could take questions, but I really would like to prefer to have my testifiers go next, and I think they're both remote. Um, thank you. I, uh, so listed uh, in this order, I have Trevor Turner from the Minnesota Council on Disability, who I think is here. Yep, that's Mr. Turner. I thought I recognized him. Um, uh, is, should, should he go first, uh, Senator Howard? I also have uh, Norb Jost and I Chuck. Well, let's go. I prefer those to go All first, right, and then good. we could let the Council on Disability go next. Very good. Um, so, Norb Jost, please uh, turn on your camera if, if you can, and uh, introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. All right. I think I've got it. Can uh, we, yep, we can hear you. Can you you can hear me okay? Great. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, my name is Norb Jost. I am uh, 67. Um, I want to thank the Senate for hearing this. I also want to thank uh, Senator Hall and particularly uh, Nicole Warwick, his staffer, who has worked so tirelessly uh, to get this bill presented. <clears throat> anyway, um, a brief history. I'm a, a retired registered nurse. I worked for the St. Claude VA my entire career. I was diagnosed with a um, genetic defect, which slowly, progressively has taken my vision. Uh, about a year, just over a year ago, um, it was determined that I have lost enough vision. Uh, I have less than 15% left, and that 15% is rather uh, cloudy and not clear, um, to be legally blind, at which time they set me up with the uh, uh, Society for the Blind to help me progress. And um, they hooked me up. Uh, well, they uh, let me back up. They told me to uh, apply for a a uh, parking permit, which I did, and I received, I did all the paperwork, jumped the hoops, and I received two temporary permits for 60 days each, with the understanding at the end of that, I would get my permanent uh, disability parking, handicapped parking. Uh, prior, about a month prior to getting my uh, permanent one, I was informed by the uh, DPS that I did not qualify, and which uh, Senator Hall has explained. Um, I would like uh, for you all to reconsider this. If you can imagine walking through a parking lot uh, without eyesight, it can be very precarious on a good day. Uh, between unattended drivers and excessive speeds, it can be, it can be interesting to say the least. And, uh, and then you add a little snow, ice, uh, even though I use a cane, that does not always tell me, uh, you know, patch ice from patch of snow to dry. And it, it just, uh, it, is, it is a hardship to have to walk through a long parking lot some days. I've had many close calls where people have actually backed into me while I was, they didn't see me, you know, walking behind them and I didn't see them moving. It, nothing came of it, but, you know, it could have. So, it's an easy fix to incorporate blindness um, into the qualifications for handicapped parking. I appreciate your time, and uh, I'd like to say hello to Chuck. Uh, let's go. He, we were classmates in high school. So thank you for your time. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Jost. Uh, Mr. Waletsko. So, Mr. Wetzko, are you speaking? We can't hear you. He's speaking. But... Oh. So, Mr. Wetzko, we uh, we can't hear you. You're not muted on Zoom, so maybe there's something on your computer that's... We're trying. Oh, there you go. I think we just heard you. Oh, can there you hear you me now? Yeah, well, we can hear you. Okay. Great. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Great. All right. Please well, introduce yourself and then proceed. With... <laughs> um, Madam Chair and committee members, thank you for the chance to share my perspective. And it must be something about the water for the class of Cathedral High School in 1973. <laughs> Norb and I are both testifying. We just... Notice that the last two minutes, so what a coincidence. Uh, frankly, I was astounded when I heard from Senator Howe that blindness wasn't covered to be able to uh, be able to cover it for a handicap pass. And I can give some very personal and very recent testimony on why this is so critical. And uh, I'm sure the Council on Disabilities and DOT had reasons for this and maybe well-intentioned, but pun intended, it's really very, very short-sighted. I mean, just last fall, uh, even with my white cane and even with my wife's assistance, I still walked smack into one of the four concrete lamp posts in my church parking lot. 
which led to my fifth corneal transplant. I say I'm an overachiever. I have two eyeballs, but I've had five corneal transplants, and I'm still five times worse than legally blind with vision in my best eye at 21,000 and worse. And as Norb mentioned, too, I mean, I wear this uh, um, medical alert fall detector, you know, that thing you see the commercials about, uh, I'm falling and I can't get up. Well, I'm only 67 like Norb, and I'm very prone to falling, even with curvatures of the sidewalk and with uh, variations in the, the pavement. And it don't even get to be talking about Minnesota ice. And so it's very, very dangerous for Norb and I to be out any further away from the entrance than we can be. And I may not be the most objective person on the Zoom call, but I would ardently, ardently support the fact that it's actually more important that legally blind people have access to the handicap pass. When people with mobility disabilities get out of their car, you know, once they're in their walker or with their cane or in their wheelchair, they're not in mortal danger. They're inconvenient, certainly, and we want to address that as best we can. But Norm and I are literally in mortal danger. We're walking into lampposts. We're falling down. Uh, we can't see the traffic. We can't see the cars. And it's more important for us, I would virtue to say, than anybody. And even though my wife's at my side and I've got a white cane, that does not mitigate the danger. Trust me, my wife cannot catch me if I fall. She couldn't stop me from walking into a concrete lamppost. So I need that disability parking pass. And I would proclaim that it's more important for us than virtually anybody else. So thank you for the chance to share that perspective. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Well, let's go. Um, Mr. Turner, welcome. Thank you, Chair Dibble. Um, I think my name is Trevor Turner, and I'm the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, and I think it might surprise some people here that actually I'm here to testify in favor of this bill um, because you know, there has been some change of hearts at the Minnesota Council on Disability as far as regarding this. I think it took somebody who was legally blind to convince the council that this is something that needs to be done. This um, legislation, the statute currently sort of allows possibly a step for interpretation for blindness to be uh, based on the mobility, whether being able to walk safely 200 feet. Um, however, that is up for an interpretation of a doctor or MnDOT or anything like this. So I think that having a bill like this to clarify and add blindness very uh, explicitly would help clarify and, and clear things up and all that. Um, you know, I would like to thank Senator Howe for bringing Senate File um, 1281 forward. Um, we, I would like to express strong, strong support for the bill itself, which adds blindness to the list of physical disabilities that qualify for an individual disability parking permit. Um, but disability parking needs to be extended to passengers as much as drivers. And while legally blind individuals cannot drive, they're often the passengers. And being able to use parking spaces for people with disabilities would help them avoid the dangers and difficulties that can come with navigating the sprawl of a parking lot. Um, as of this year, 26 states have already implemented blindness in their physical disability definition for the purpose of parking permits, giving more people access to the accessible parking that they would benefit from. Um, Senate File 1281 presents a great opportunity for Minnesota to do the same and join over half the states in the nation that providing this access. The Minnesota Council on Disability believes in Minnesota where people uh, with disabilities can live with full opportunities and inclusion in the communities of their choice. And one of many com components of that goal is providing people with physical disabilities, including those who are legally blind with safe and accessible parking. And we are, so we urge the Senate Transportation Committee to support Senate File 1281 and expand the important resource for accessible parking to Minnesotans who are legally blind. Thank you. Now I'll stand for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, questions, members? All right, Senator Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I have been in contact with, uh, with uh, Representative Hicks, who uh, uh, is proposing a, an amendment to, to this, and she would like to, to add autism to the, to the piece. I have not uh, given that a lot of thought. I, I haven't... Uh, we just, we just kind of mentioned that here right now. I think we're going to give some more thought to that, and, and, but that can happen in that chamber as far as I'm concerned, and we can have that discussion then. But uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I would move that uh, I don't think this needs to go anywhere else. If it could go to the floor, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks. I'll call to see if anyone else would like to testify on Senate File 1281. 
Seeing none, Senator Howe moves Senate File 1281 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Senate floor. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Senator Howe. Senator Morrison, bring us home. Welcome to the table, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for hearing Senate File 2272, a bill to ensure access to disability parking. Current law allows a 24-hour grace period for the owner or manager of a property or business to properly mark and clear the space of a disability parking spot after a law enforcement officer has noticed a problem and issued a warning. Disability parking is notoriously hard to enforce and current statute makes it harder. The Minnesota Council on Disability receives hundreds of reports of disability parking being blocked by loading trucks, plowed snow, storage containers, etc. It's the responsibility of businesses to ensure that their disability parking is kept free from obstruction, but some businesses use their disability parking spaces for unloading and loading, storage, and plowed snow. There really should be no grace period that allows discrimination against people with disabilities, and it makes it easier for law enforcement to apply this law since they only need to visit the offending site once. People with disabilities rely on disability parking to leave their homes, participate in the economy, buy food, visit doctors, and be part of their community. And it's common knowledge that it is illegal to use disability parking for anything else. A 24-hour grace period is unnecessary. This statute was actually written in 1987, which predates the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's time to update the law and bring it in line with the ADA. Disability parking is a right, not a privilege. Let's fix this statute. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will hand it over to Mr. Turner. Welcome back, Mr. Turner. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Dibble. My name is, again, my name is Trevor Turner, and I'm the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, we would like to thank Senator Morrison for bringing Senate File 2272 forward, and we would like to also express our strong support for this bill, which would eliminate the 24-hour grace period for property owners or managers to remove obstruction from disability parking spaces. The Council on Disability has heard from community members about situations where businesses will obstruct disability parking spaces in cases including unloading and loading boxes, storage, or using space for plowed snow. This prevents these parking spaces from being used as intended by Minnesotans who need them. Currently, a peace officer can only offer a warning to businesses for obstructing the disability parking, after which the business has 24 hours to move it before a fine can be le levied. This leads to an enforcement issue where a business can use disability parking spaces at will for things other than parking for disabled uh, customers, provided that they move the obstruction within 24 hours. However, the, the ADA mandates that disability parking should never be used for anything other than parking for people with disabilities. There's no enforcement mechanism for this mandate other than a person bringing a lawsuit to businesses, which most people with disabilities would not do and most businesses would not welcome. It's already difficult to enforce disability parking rules, and the 24-hour grace period rule makes it even harder. The statute that Senate File 2272 amends was written in 1987, as Senator Morrison said, and the ADA already... Um, Go ahead. The ADA already mandates that uh, disability parking uh, is for disability parking only. But as I said before, the only way to enforce that is through lawsuit and litigation. We also need to recognize that Minnesota, there needs to be a leeway for snow. So we su also support updating the statute specifically to specify that plowed snow cannot be blocked, cannot block disability parking. Disability parking spaces are meant only for the use of people with disabilities. Please support Senate File 2272 to ensure that this will always happen, not just when it's convenient for businesses. Thank you, Chair Dibble and members of the committee. And I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Questions, members? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I just want to make sure, especially in a year like we're having this, this year with all this snow, it's plowed snow because many, many uh, ordinance, city ordinances that give you 24 hours to clear the sidewalk in front of your place and, and so it's plowed snow, not just for our natural, uh, God-given uh, snow. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Howe, for that question. Yes, it's explicitly plowed snow. Thank you. All right, uh, Senator Hart. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Morrison, for bringing this bill. Um, this is something I probably never would have paid attention to uh, a few years ago. And now that I use a cane and have uh, a disability that affects my ability to walk and I use disability parking, this happens all the time. Um, it is all the time. And so I think you know, making sure that law enforcement can enforce um, what we have on the books to make sure that people can access their communities, can go shopping, can run their errands. I think it's a really critical piece of it. Um, so thank you for bringing this bill. I think it's really important. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Morrison. And I agree with Senator Port because I was in a wheelchair uh, about a year ago and I, I use that as well, so I understand that. But um, one thing I also have done a lot of property management day in the business and, and sometimes the business owner can't uh, watch everything that's going on and sometimes it happens uh, without their knowledge. So I'd like to offer an A1 amendment that I, I hope you would consider friendly. It just has a little technical amendment. It was posted. Uh, so with that, I'd ask for, uh, offer the A1. Senator Drzezinski offers the A1, which would insert the word knowingly in front of the word allows on line 10. Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Drzezinski. We will accept your friendly amendment. I recommend a yes vote. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything further, members? All in favor of the A1, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Uh, would anyone else like to testify on 2272? All right, seeing none. Members, anything further? Senator Morrison, final word and a motion. Uh, uh, Chair Dibble, is this, I believe this is this bill's only stop. Yes, uh, okay. Senator Morrison. Uh, then the I would move that we pass the bill to general register. As amended. As amended. All right. <laughs> Senate All file 2272. All in favor of Senator Morrison's motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Thank Senator you, Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Chair and members. All right, members, uh, we are finished almost on time. Actually, given that we started six minutes late, we are on time. Um, Ms. Ethier, we have a lot of bills on Wednesday, and, uh, and then members we're going to meet on Friday at noon in G23. Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. Do we know approximately how long, what the agenda looks like on Friday? Is it noon until 3? Is it noon until 5? Is it noon until noon 30? Or? I aspire uh, to replicate the experience of judiciary, and we'll go till midnight, 1 o'clock. No, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't actually know, but I, I, don't, I don't think, I, my sense is it's not going to be too bad. Um, I don't think we're going to have super controversial bills that will bog us down. I think we just need to get a few, few items cleared, including from your members, Senator Jasinski. So. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair? Uh, Senator Howe. Is there going to be a remote option available? Yes, absolutely, yes. So, uh, Ms. Um, Ethier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our Wednesday hearing, we will be hearing 11 separate bills. Um, we'll be hearing bills on separate topics, including um, Indian employment preference and Senator Kunesh, um, construction workforce training, uh, electrifying the state fleet, uh, getting an adjustment to motor vehicle taxes, uh, rental taxes, and um, transporting various items including propane, lumber, sewage, uh, grass seed, and soybean oil, um, and uh, those, uh, the effects that those vehicles have on county roads. All right. Anything further, members? We are adjourned.